and just thinking about what it is that fills your spiritual cup or fills my spiritual cup in the long run. It was about teaching. I think we have about 430 kids, 450 kids, and it's with very little to no advertising. Welcome to Tea with My Uncle Iros. Lazy Susan style conversations with mentors and musicians that have inspired me over the years. I'm your host, Son of Paper. Uncle Iroh is a character in Avatar who my generation has deemed the most wise and patient mentor ever. And so this season, I sat down with my uncles and aunties to pick their brains on how to best navigate this planet with wisdom, grace, and compassion. And what better beverage for conversation than tea? All right, welcome to the podcast for today. My guest is very special. It is Shawnee Simpson. He was my coach for SEAL soccer. I think I first joined SEALs around the seventh grade. So we've known each other for quite a while and way before I was an artist, which is uh, awesome. And there's so many things that I've, I've learned, not only just from being coached by you, Shawnee, but also after I even quit soccer, because I actually didn't play soccer very much longer after that, stopping around sophomore year of high school. But I could continue to have a relationship with Shawnee. And sometimes we just bump into, bump into each other on the streets of SF or in random open gyms. <laughs> It's it just great to have you around, and and I know that I can always call you. And we've talked about music and stuff too, so I'm just excited to to get into it. Can you introduce yourself to people that may not know you? Thanks, Kyle. My name's Shawnee Simpson. I uh, was born in Kenya. I lived there until I was about three. Moved to Santa Barbara. Lived there until I was about five, and I've lived in San Francisco ever since. Fell in love with soccer. I started playing when I was about five, but it was the 82 World Cup and I was watching in Santa Barbara with my Italian family. Italy won the 82 World Cup and that kind of sealed the deal for me. I've been crazy about soccer ever since. And like you said, I started coaching you when you were about 12 years old with a few of your friends. I know you were, I think originally you were on the Rebel Rams or you were on a <laughs> team called the Rams and we were, we were PSG, which... We might have been a year younger than you or a division below you, but. How did you first become that the coach of that team? I was playing uh, professionally and I was getting towards the end of wanting to keep playing or just keep going through that grind. John Hale, who had a son at French American, talked to a few different parents from the Chinese American school and suggested combining the two teams and he was going to get a coach. John reached out to my dad because I think he went to a few SEALs games. My dad recommended that I meet John and I went and I did a training session at West Sunset on the baseball diamond. The guys were like eight or nine years old. And uh, I, I remember Freddie pretty vividly <laughs> just because he was a handful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember JB and Gabriel and Robin who had the long curly hair while I was playing. Uh, professionally, I was getting hired to do individual training sessions and coach a couple teams. And usually they're pretty high level competitive teams. And so to coach a very young team and a team that was a school based team was a bit of a challenge. Let's fast forward a bit to when I was on the team. So this was a couple of years later, perhaps. Yeah. I'll tell you my initial experience, I guess, or like perspective. And then I love to hear yours about that squad. The talent was already was like clear that that we had talented players but what stuck out most for me was the system was so different than any other team that i ever seen or played um, against or with in that it was so much more about developing properly and in your um your just your past technique versus for the casual soccer fan like in the barcelona style in a way what what most kids most um teams our age did which was basically you had your super talented forwards or really athletic kids and you would just kind of long ball it to them and try to take advantage of your size or like just having an academy or something and just being able to pull from the very best players of every region the way that seals handled business was just so different and i, I was uh initially very frustrated going to practice like all we do is just pass the ball like we're not working on thought things that i thought were more important for winning games uh, can you say more about that and from your perspective? Yeah. And for me, you know, my interaction with John Hale and growing up in the SEAL system or growing up 
my father was a coach or slash also my mentor. The life experiences that I gained from those two helped me with that group or just helped me maybe with my approach to coaching kids. And Freddie and Jeremy were a part of that journey because after coaching a few training sessions, I remember telling John, you know, we, we just got to get rid of Freddie and Jeremy. You know, they're talented, but goof around too much, very disruptive at training. You know, they're always doing what they want to do and distracts, you know, say Dylan, for example, who is a fantastic training player. You ask him to do something, he focuses, he tries to do it. And he actually picked up a lot of the techniques very fast. And so in my mind, okay, let's replace them and get two other players. And John was like, they're eight and nine years old. You know, that's what they're supposed to do. And my dad, who's a pediatrician and neonatologist, you know, well, why are you doing this? Do you want to teach these kids how to play or do you, you know, just want to make money or do you just want to win games? And so it's one of those aha light bulb moments where you realize John and my dad are right. It's like, I mean, I don't do this just to make money and I, I like coaching. I, I really enjoy teaching, but it's easy to teach the more competitive kid. It's easy to teach the player that knows if they don't listen or focus that they're gone. And so for me, trying to connect with Freddie and Jeremy and being patient with them, you know, it was going to help Freddie and Jeremy, but it was going to help me too become a better person, a better coach. And that was part of the process. And that essentially is the SEALs philosophy. This is about the journey. It's not necessarily about being state champs or regional champs or national champs. It's not necessarily about making the U.S. national team. It's about putting in the work right now. Just give your best effort and whatever happens is going to happen. And that's what's going to make you happy. You know, the, you're going to win the state title and then the next day, it's going to be just another day. You know, those feelings that you had and that success that you had, it was momentary. What have you found is the best like mix of trying to get the best out of a player when they perhaps can't handle the pressure or a kid that loves loves being a bit more firm? Yeah, you know, I think it's a long-term or long-goal process. You are a different personality than, say, Freddie, right? Dylan is a different personality. So the approach that a coach or a coach that I need to take is how can I help Dylan get to a point where he's as confident as I think he could be or should be? It can be challenging trying to figure out how to connect with players because your coach has a vision of what they think that you can do and maybe what you can't do. And then the player has a vision of what they think they can do and what they can't do. And so trying to, I guess, establish that relationship so that, you know, there, there's a meeting point of the minds where both, you know, the player and the coach can understand this is where we are. And that's why relationships are so important. <laughs> just, just want the last, the last little soccer tangent, I guess I wanted to bring up was the experience of going to Gothia and going to Sweden. And those are still to this day, the only two European countries I've been to <laughs> and I, we were not really in the cities at all and we were just kind of in the rural areas hanging out with other soccer people and it was but it was like one of the best trips of my life and okay. there are so many iconic moments from like I was not part of the the team that like went super deep in the tournament and and beat that crazy Paris team or whatever but I was part of the I was part of the second year where I feel like I learned, I played my best soccer during that time that I've ever played. And I just felt like I was learning so much about, I never thought about visualization. That was, I think, when you introduced that to us, the concept of visualizing before a game, what you're going to do, which I used a lot in track. There's so many iconic moments that I still talk, I bring up with Dylan or Jackson, whoever, getting haircuts from you. <laughs> There's just so many moments that just stick out. What do you remember about that tournament, whether it's about me directly or just about the overall team and experience. Great group of guys that you know, they all liked each other. They all wanted to play. And part of the process for Europe was trying to have meetings with each player to help them understand my vision or my perspective of them as a player and what I thought that they could work on or what they needed to work on to take their game to another level. Also trying to teach how to prepare for a competition because you know, mental visualization I think can help in a lot of different scenarios not just sports because you, you essentially try to create a level of focus or you try to create what it is that you want to achieve in that moment 
and you try to create some triggers, you know, so that if you do lose focus or if you do lose concentration or confidence, that it doesn't take you that long to get back on that thought process of what it is that you're trying to do. I mean, a lot of you have told me that you really appreciated that those exercises without exercise. And that's what I enjoy the most is trying to pass on information that I've learned that really helped me as a player and also as a person. Because I, I use mental visualization all the time. In the shower, I try to do a few minutes, just clear my head and, you know, just trying to create little triggers so that I don't get too frustrated or I don't get, a, you know, you have these snowball thoughts sometimes about something that you want to do. And it's very easy for the negative thoughts to gain momentum, right? And so breathing and trying to create triggers to keep your mind on task for me has helped a lot. And that's, I know we're all different, but I think, oh, well, I mean, this works for me. I think it'll work for my players too. And I, you know, I would tell you guys, you, know, you don't just have to do this for soccer. Right? I mean, this is, this is really good just in the sense of just keeping your mind on track with what it is that you want to do. Okay. So I, two things come up. Uh, uh, I, I want to talk about the Burma Haven game. I think we played them twice actually. Yeah. But I wanted to first talk about, yeah, the idea of Americans playing soccer, because I'm sure that of all, like of all people, you probably have probably faced lots of stereotyping. Like people don't think very highly of American soccer in general. Yeah, America doesn't have a real culture of soccer. A lot of the teams that fans support, and it can go back generations. Right? And there, there's a culture because teams come from clubs and the clubs are social groups, a real sense of commitment and drive for the club. And in the U.S., we don't have that, uh, that community around a certain club where people are just driven to represent that club and that club be the best that it can be. You know, we're playing Bremerhaven, we're playing, uh, I think it was Ghent, you know, we're playing Ghent, and you have a group of kids, like, they're there to represent Ghent, they're there to represent Bremerhaven, and these guys want to be pros for Ghent, they want to be pros for Bremerhaven, so there, there's a different level of passion and commitment towards winning and competing and performing that, you know, Americans don't necessarily have. Yeah, the, the one game that sticks out from that tournament the most was that the game against Bremerhaven. We played them twice. First game, I think, was a tie. And the second one, we lost by one. And I'll never forget two moments from that game. One was the one that led to a goal where uh, me and Dylan should have gotten to the ball and just not let it bounce because it's super dangerous in soccer to let the ball bounce in the box of all places. <laughs> but bef before that, I don't know if I ever told you about this, but... I was absolutely shutting down their two best players, their two strikers, the like one guy with the like slick hair. And then the other guy was the super big uh, German African guy. Like I, I could, I could hold them because they, they weren't that skilled. The second time we played them, <laughs> they were playing mind games with me. I don't know if I told you that. Maybe, I don't, maybe you did. Yeah. I don't remember. So the, the, the striker, what he did, I mean, even in hockey, this would be a foul. Like, you know, it's like, that you can't hit someone when they're away from the ball, right? Yeah, yeah. But the ball went like all like to the other side, so the ref was looking that way, and he just sprinted at me and like trucked me essentially. And then I was like, ref, and then the ref didn't see it. So then there was like, I, I can't help you, bro. <laughs> and I remember I, I was so mad, and it and it shook me up for part of the game, right? And I was like, what is happening? And it got me off my game. Maybe that sort of led to the goal, perhaps. But I I talked to him afterwards. I was like, yo, what what was that, man? Like, I thought we were cool. Like, we, had to, we hung out. And he was like, honestly, you were just defending us super well. And, like, I didn't think we were going to win. So I did something dirty to, like, to try to get you off your game. And that's something I don't think any American player would ever think to do. That goes back to that, you know, that passion, that professionalism. Because maybe the coach played professionally and says, listen, that guy's shutting you down. What you need to do is you need to break his focus, right? You know, say something to him. Hit him and get him not thinking about the game and get him thinking about you or what you just did. And that, you know, that goes back to the, you know, the, the mental visualization and trying to create those triggers so that you, you stay on task with what you want, because there are people who will in different areas of life, right? They'll, they'll do something to distract you from what it is that you need to do because they know if you're distracted or if you lose focus, that's an advantage though. I was wondering if you could, if we could sh sh shift gears to, to go more into present time. 
Sure. And um, talk about music, talk about, I guess, your observations of me, like ever since I've stopped playing soccer and as well as where Seals is at now. Um, I'd love to hear more. Like I've heard from my uncle a little bit, but not too much. Yeah, you can jump off any, anywhere you want to talk about. Yeah, well, I've, you know, I've known you since, yeah, you were about probably 12. You, you've always been the type of person who puts in 100%. When you come to practice, you don't you know, go halfway or when you play in the game, you don't go halfway. You know, when you decided to put in extra work for track, you know, you, you went all in, you know, you, I could be going for a random run at Kizar almost any day of the week, say four o'clock. And, you know, you were there working with a team, working with a one-on-one with a coach, you know, you were definitely, you know, putting on size and you were in the gym because I can see you getting bigger. Right? When you decided to do hip hop, I knew that you were going to be good at it because that's just your personality. It's not like you were going to kind of try and write lyrics or kind of try to figure out how to make beats or how to make music. You know, you were going to give 100% and you were going to try to learn it in a way that you fully understood it. Yeah, the the idea that it's not really about soccer that what you taught me, but something so much more, right? So much, something more applicable about process and the journey i find myself in a in an interesting position now where i'm tutoring chess and i'm teaching kids not like some of them are, are could be really good really strong players some of them are just doing it because their parents are making them or <laughs> they kind of enjoy it but they don't really they're not super serious about it it's it feels a little full circle you know that that in the same way that you were teaching kids uh coaching kids of all levels um and finding what works for them, but like also having this long-term goal in mind with the kid where you want them to learn things about life, not just soccer. Cause most of us, especially in the States are not going to be professional soccer players. Just having c- tremendous coaches like yourself who would just really tailor every uh, interaction and, and coaching style to each kid made, made me a better, made me to be a successful chess tutor right now beyond music it, it really helped a lot so I'm, I'm thankful for that you had a lot to give those kids so yeah that's awesome that you're teaching kids how to play chess was my team the first restart team yeah so you, your team was the first yeah restart team of the sfusc slash seals program and then your cousin juju's team was the second team and and yeah. so that's a three-year gap right uh yeah and yeah after that how did it become how did it become 36 teams you know <laughs> i think they people appreciated the approach of trying to teach as opposed to trying to win games they're just thinking about what it is that fills your spiritual cup or fills my spiritual cup in the long run mm. you know it, it was about teaching i think we're right now we're, we have about 430 kids 450 kids you know it's with very little to no advertising I think families and kids have been attracted to the program just because I think they hear that we are trying to teach and it's not just about winning and it really is about the long-term development of the player. I think that's how it went from two teams to 36 teams because teams and parents would email me and contact me and I wasn't very well organized to think about making it a business so I'd have somebody who played for the SEALs or someone I knew who was looking for coaching and said, Hey, this team, they want to be a sales team. Do you want to coach them? And so it was, a, it was almost like franchises. I heard that there's like a, like Jeremy told me that he goes to Kizar and he sees just a wave of, of that, that really bright orange, <laughs> <laughs> all the new seals kids. When we are at Kizar, we'll get anywhere from say a hundred to sometimes 200 kids out there during a three hour period. Awesome. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great place to, to end it so you can go get some dinner. But we'll just do a cheers will be the end of the show. So, thanks cheers. for joining me, Shawnee. Okay. I think we have the same cup. No, oh, no, mine, <laughs> my, mine has ridges on it. <laughs> cheers. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tea with My Uncle Iros. Catch us every Monday on your favorite podcasting service. TWMUI is written and produced by me definitely rate and review us on iTunes and follow me at Son of Paper on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Theme music by Keys. For more, visit facebook.com slash unlockedkeys. Spill with y'all next time on Tea with my Uncle Iros.